All right. So uh, um, I guess we can continue with the Anapanasati Sutta. So we are about uh, halfway through. We have been looking at the first eight of the 16 stages of mindfulness of breathing. Yeah. And we have looked at the, these are the equivalent of the contemplation of the body and the contemplation of feelings, the Kaya Nupasana and the Vedana Nupasana of the Satipatthana Sutta. So now we can move on to the uh, Chitta Nupasana. And uh, it's kind of interesting as we move on from uh, one to the next one, it kind of just goes deeper and deeper. And one of the things that come out of this when you see this uh, is that the degrees of happiness, the degrees of peace, the degrees of uh, joy on this path, they kind of are, there's a large number of degrees. Uh, and you're kind of moving on and on and on. And you kind of wonder where it's going to end. Yeah, there's so much happiness. How much happiness can you take, right? There must be a, there's a limit to how much happiness the human mind can bear. Yes? No? Maybe? <laughs> no? <laughs> Unbearable happiness. Yeah, some people say, can't, don't, don't, no, there's too much happiness. I don't know how to deal with this happiness. Uh, and uh, it's, it's kind of the, because the bliss and the energy and everything is so powerful, you don't know what to do with yourself. Uh, yeah, this is kind of one of the things that happens as you practice this path. Uh, and uh, so that is kind of extraordinary. And what that means is that the happiness and the peace that you get when you get to the real samadhi, we haven't even got to the real samadhi yet. Uh, yeah, we're kind of just playing around with the preliminary joys and happiness. Uh, the joy and happiness that comes when you get to the real deal is like really amazing and really extraordinary and so uh, uh, you know so sometimes a very important point here is this uh, idea sometimes there's lots of arguments about when do you get to the jhanas when do you get to real samadhi what is the real samadhi can you just count the jhana factors and this is kind of one of the classic words count the jhana factors uh, then you know whether you have real samadhi or real jhana or not yeah the first jhana is supposed to have five jhana factors right vitaka vichara piti sukha and ekagata and so I've got all five, okay, must be first jhana. But it's not as simple as that, uh, because uh, these jhana factors themselves come in a large variety of degrees. Uh, yeah, and so you have to be careful. It's not, uh, you have to have a much broader outlook again in the suttas. Uh, jhana factors are only talked about once in all the suttas. Uh, it's a very rare thing. Uh, and it's more of a commentarial idea, these factors. Uh, and so again, it shows you the danger of relying too much on later ideas rather than going back to the suttas. In the sutta, there's a deepening of peace, deepening of happiness, deeper and deeper, until eventually you kind of enter the other world, the happiness of the samadhi and the jhanas. So what do you reckon? Sounds good, huh? Yeah? Anyone thinks it sounds bad? Huh? Anyone awake? <laughs> Sorry, I'm <was> being naughty. <laughs> sounds good, doesn't it? It's kind of really amazing. You have all of these kind of extraordinary things and building up and up and up. And sometimes we think that the, uh, the path, you know, the, the whole path is like this. The po whole path has all these elements uh, that makes the whole, the whole practice very interesting. It's not just about where we're going, but the path itself is very, very powerful and very interesting. Okay, I know it's difficult after lunch. Yeah, I have to admit, it's not so easy after lunch. Uh, so have you had a nice cup of coffee after lunch? Uh, yeah, it's important, right, to kind of get you, get you started after lunch. Uh. So I'm going to follow, follow suit. Mm. Wow, this is really hot. This is nice. Okay, now, Poppy Samadhi. No, yeah, I, I think that's cool. I think that's a bit too much delusion there, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish there were a coffee somebody. <laughs> okay, so let's kind of move on. So now we come, we have looked at the Kahanipasana and Vedanipasana, and we're going to go to the Chittanipasana, contemplation of the mind, and the four stages of Anapanasati that is equivalent to that. So, uh, so here we go. This is the first part. And the practice like this. Uh, I will breathe in experiencing the mind. The practice like this. Uh, I'll breathe out experiencing the mind. That's kind of interesting. What does that mean? I'll tell you in a second. 
Uh, they practice like this. I'll breathe in, gladdening the mind. They practice like this. I'll breathe out, gladdening the mind. They practice like this. I'll breathe in, stilling the mind. I'll practice like this. I'll breathe out, stilling the mind. They practice like this. I'll breathe in, freeing the mind. They practice like this. I'll breathe out, freeing the mind. It's all about mind. So now you can see why this is called Chitta Vipassana. It's all about mind all the way through. So um, what does this mean? Let's go back to the uh, beginning here. Yeah? So this kind of gives us some clues about what this is about. Uh, the practice like this, experiencing the mind, the Chittang Patisang Vedi. Um, what does it mean to experience the mind? Uh, surely the mind is always here. We're always experiencing the mind, right? Uh, the mind is where the thoughts are going on, that's where your imagination is going on. Uh, the mind is always present. So what does it mean here to experience the mind? Uh, and this is where you kind of learn from uh, teachers like um, Ajahn Brahm, etc. And Ajahn Brahm taught me, very, taught these things very early on, that if you want to experience something, yeah, if you want to know what something is, you have to kind of separate it from the things it is not. Uh, and when you remove the things that it is not, what remains is the thing itself. Uh, yeah, so what is not the mind? Uh, and uh, in the, from a Buddhist point of view, what is not the mind is the other five senses. Uh, yeah, they are not the mind. Uh, that's kind of the Buddhist idea of mind here. So by removing the other five senses, at least a lot, yeah, as far as we can, or at least where they really start to disappear a lot, what remains then is the mind. So how does this, how does this happen in meditation? Well, as you go through the sequence we have been looking at, you're calming things down, you're experiencing more and more joy and happiness. There comes a point when the five hindrances, the five senses and the body start to fade away very powerfully. At the same point, when they start to fade away very powerfully, it is usually when you start to see things that are often called nimittas, yeah, in the uh, in kind of present, in the contemporary discourse of meditation, often called nimittas, like lights in the mind, and kind of specific kind of lights, and lights that have a certain shape, have a certain power, uh, often they look a bit like the sun or the moon or something like that, yeah, often very brilliant lights, uh, that is where you start to experience the mind, because the mind emerges the moment the five senses disappear. That is what, you, that is what emerges at that time, yeah? the bright lights. So this is really what I take and why I understand here to mean the experiencing of the mind. We haven't yet got to the jhanas yet, because that comes a bit further on when we come to the mochayang chitang, the liberating of the mind. This is prior to that. So that is the... I take here to be the experience of the mind. So you go from uh, great feelings that are conjoined with the breath, the Veda and Vipassana, and you take this leap and you move on to experiencing the mind itself. So how do you take that leap? Yeah, because very often people will say, oh, I saw some lights in my meditation. Are they the real thing? Are they the nimittas we're talking about? Or are they not? Are they stable enough? Are they strong enough? And all of these kind of things. So how can we kind of take that leap. But sometimes people stay with the bliss, the nimittas never arise, they just have strong feelings. So what is the thing that allows us to move from one to the next one? And the thing that allows us to move here, remember we are moving away from the five senses to the mind. So you have to let go a little bit more of the five senses. And so you have to best basically remember, you have to basically very quickly reflect or bring up the perception of impermanence or dukkha in the five senses or the body, if you like, the body is just one of the five senses. And as you do that, as you bring that up and you remember that these things are not satisfactory because you can't really control them because it is a lesser kind of happiness, it's not really interesting, that is, by that kind of letting go, then you can move on to the mind more easily. Yeah? So sometimes you have to kind of use, again, these kind of very simple ideas, just a very... But it's just a perception, it's not really a reflection. The perception of where happiness lies and where... Dukkha lies, uh, and that perception will then help the mind to make the transition from feelings to mind, from Vedana to Chitta. Yeah, that is kind of the idea here. Very often the transition, again, happens by itself, because when the feelings become very powerful, you experience a lot of bliss and these kind of things, then the nimittas arise, because the nimittas are very closely associated with the idea of bliss and happiness and joy. Yeah, yeah? so then the nimitta will come because that is the terrain in which nimittas arise. 
Nimitta is like happiness, sir. They come out when there's happiness, sir. Yeah, that's kind of the idea. No, no. Nimitta without happiness is not a nimitta. It's, they're just lights in the mind. So this is how you make that jump from one to the next one. Because each time you move from one satipatthana to the next one, uh, there is like a slightly shift in things. Yeah? You're abandoning one thing, entering on some, to something else. Uh, that is why the shift from kaya and upasana to vedana and upasana sometimes takes a little bit of perception and contemplation. Okay, I've got to experience the bliss. Okay, so let me bring up something which gives rise to happiness. That's why it is hard to move from Vedana to Chitta, because again, we're letting go of something and moving on to something else. So. And this is kind of the idea here. So, you, okay, you reject that, you move on to something else. So. Very often this happens automatically. Yeah. And so there is no problem, but sometimes a little bit of help can be, uh, can be very useful in these cases. So, so what are these nimitas? So? How do you know if you have a nimitta? Is it even called a nimitta? Is that the right word for it? In the suttas, it's not called a nimitta. In the suttas, a nimitta means a foundation or a basis. In the suttas, a nimitta means an object of meditation. So, for example, the four satipatthanas are called the nimitta of samadhi. They are the foundation or the object of samadhi. And this is what we're seeing now. The breath is the object that takes you to samadhi. So the four satipatthanas are the nimitta of samadhi, of jhana. Yeah, it takes you there. Or you can say that uh, uh, another, some, the samadhi nimitta is in one sutta said to be the cemetery contemplation. So when you do the cemetery contemplation based on that nimitta, nimitta is like a vision or a sign or an object, however you want to call it in this case, so that leads to samadhi. So samadhi nimitta is basically the object or the foundation that gives rise to samadhi later on. That's what it means in the suttas. Uh, it doesn't mean the kind of the bright light. Uh, the bright light uh, is uh, in the suttas uh, is more called a nubasa. A nubasa means a light uh, or a splendor or a radiance, something like that. Uh, and in the Upakilesa sutta, it is called, uh, uh, the, you, it is specifically said, the Three famous monks of the Upaklesa Sutta, the Anuruddha, Nandi, and Kimbila. I think I did that Sutta here last year, maybe. I can't remember it. Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. Uh, but these are like the, the ideal monks in the Suttas. Uh, and they see these lights and forms, uh, Ubasa and Rupa. Yeah? Then the light and forms disappear. Uh, and that is the nimittas that they see, because then they use that to enter jhana afterwards. Uh. So what is called now called nimittas used to be called Ubasa and Rupa. Yeah, when the Obasa and Rupa come together, that's when you have the real nimitta. Obasa means a splendor and a form. Yeah, so if you have, like, see the sun, the sun is a splendor because the sun is brilliant and it has a form because it has a shape. Yeah, it is round. So that shape together with the splendor, that is the real nimitta. So if you see just any old light in your mind, it may not be the real deal because it is not bright enough, doesn't have enough power, it doesn't come with bliss and all of these kind of things. So it may not be the real nimitta. It is not just any shape or color. It is a specific one, which is beautiful and powerful and has a lot of bliss coming with it. Uh, that's how you know it is the real thing. Yeah. This is what you should be looking out for. Uh, yeah? And um, probably some of you have had some of these experiences in your meditation. Uh, and if that's the case, great. Uh, well done. Uh, and uh, that's good. Uh. So these are what we are looking for uh, and this is what, uh, what comes down the track. Yeah? And this is where you start to enter a different reality. Yeah? Because you're leaving the body behind, leaving the senses behind. Uh, the mind is becoming very peaceful. Uh, you start to enter a different world, uh, a world of pure bliss, a world of pure purity, uh, a world where the ordinary experiences are left behind. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why it can be also a bit scary. People can be scared of these uh, nimittas, these obasas, uh, because they seem so powerful. Uh. It's like you feels a bit like you're losing yourself. Uh. And that's scary when you're losing yourself. Uh. Yeah. What? What about me? Can't I, I? I would like to enjoy these lights. Yeah. I don't want to kind of disappear just when the lights are there, uh, because when you're disappearing, it's kind of scary. Uh. But then you start to get used to it. Uh. Because what is disappearing is just a certain aspect, like the will is disappearing. The ability to do is disappearing. Yeah. But because that is so close to who we think we are, yeah, yeah when that disappears, it's like, whoa, you want to hold on a little bit. And so you kind of jump back from the nimitta. Don't really dare to go in there. Yeah? So you, you have, again, you have to contemplate the, uh, 
the danger in all this movement and the, actually the pain in always kind of being very active in the mind and also the five senses that encourage the mind to move on to these nimittas, these brilliant lights. So it is very unfamiliar ter terrain when you start out and it seems very strange and very difficult to square, can I be there or not when these things happen? But after a while you get used to it. And once you get used to it, it is the ordinary terrain that is unfamiliar. There's the ordinary five senses that seem kind of alien, and this seems much better. This seems much more like the real home, the real you, the real place you want to be. Why? Because it's just far superior. You feel much more alive. It gives much more meaning to it. If you are mindful, it's much stronger. You feel you're really present. The bliss is enormous. Of course you want these things. And then the ordinary life seems like more gray, dull, boring. Yeah, Who cares about ordinary life? And that's when you come to Ajahn Brahm and say, please, make me a monk or a nun. Yeah? Because you understand what actually what the spiritual path really is about. Why be a layperson? Okay, so you have commitments. In that case, you've got to fulfill those commitments. Please don't run away from your family. <laughs> but uh, if you haven't got any com great commitments, then you know, you, this is kind of when you start uh, looking at these things, because you start to understand the potential of this path. Yeah, it's very, very remarkable and amazing here. Yeah. So this is the first one, experiencing the mind, the uh, citta tatti sang vedi. All right, let's move on to the next one. They practice like this. I will breathe in gladdening the mind. Uh, Abhipamodayang citta. Abhipamodayang is um, gladdening. Abhi. Pamodana is pam, like pamodati, yeah? Uh, pamudja, same thing, yeah? So gladdening the mind. So you come to the stage of the uh, nimittas, and then <clears throat> you want to make it even more powerful, even more glad, even more bright. So you, you gladden the mind. And the way to do this is to hang out with the nimitta. Don't do anything. Don't try to make it happy. Don't try to do nothing. Let's go more. Uh, <clears throat> leave more things behind. And as you do that, the mind gladdens by itself because you are just enjoying the nimitta. You're focusing on the most happy part of it, being, a, being still, just uh, enjoying what's going on. And as you do that, that the, again, it's a natural process uh, that this becomes even more happy. The gladdening of the mind is not up to you. It is a process that happens to you. You are the passenger on the train, uh, looking out the window, and now the scenery is very, very nice. Uh, the best scenery you've ever seen in your life or felt in your life. You're not even seeing much at this point. Seeing is kind of stopping. And you're just really, really, really happy. Gladdening the mind. They practice like this. I will breathe in, stilling the mind. Samadhan, samadhan chittanga, stilling the mind. They practice like this. I will breathe out, stilling the mind. It's pretty still already, but you uh, can always make it more still. Uh, yeah, the tiniest kind of movement will um, will make this, uh, these uh, experiences more unstable. Uh, you want to make it super duper stable. Uh, so we keep on focusing on the happiness, focusing on the joy, focusing on the these nimittas in the middle of it, uh, allowing it to become even more still, even more happy. Uh, you will notice again, this is exactly what I've been and of saying all along now that for every stage here, there is more stillness and more happiness. You keep on gladdening things, keeping on making it more and more happy, more and more still, yeah, stage by stage as you go on. This is another one of these stages. So even more still, even more peaceful. Keep going in the same direction as one direction only. Stillness and gladness and happiness and bliss. That is the direction. So... Um, Yeah, so you just uh, hang out there, don't do very much, uh, uh, and allow the process to happen. And then we come to the very last of the 12, the first 12 stages, the last stage of the citta nupassana, contemplation of the mind. They practice like this, I will breathe in, freeing the mind. They practice like this, I will breathe out, freeing the mind. Vimochayang, citta, yeah. Vimochayang is the same word as vimutti, just the verbal form of vimutti, so freeing the mind. And again, you don't free the mind. 
freeing the mind happens to you. You are the passenger on this wonderful, amazing ride, and you're just trusting the Dhamma to take, uh, take its course for you. So the freeing of the mind happens. How, what does that mean that the mind is freeing? It means that you are finally eliminating the five senses altogether. So far, the five senses have been there in the background. The breath has maybe been with you very, very faintly, yeah, somewhere possibly all the way to the very end. Most of the time, you're not aware of it, but sometimes it may be there as like an anchor, a background reality. But now you go beyond everything, the five senses. And beyond this point, five senses are completely gone. No more hearing, no more nothing in the five sense world there. And so that's, you can imagine, so there's like a shift in perception happening at this point. Yeah, you're moving over. And uh, there's no more, and the nimitta there, the nimitta is gone. Now there's just bliss uh, at the other side of this shift that happens when you enter the first uh, jhana. So you're freeing the mind from the five senses, you're freeing the mind from the five hindrances. Viviceva kamehi, vivicha akusalehi damehi. This is the entry phrase when you enter the first jhana. Viviceva kamehi, utterly uh, aloof, utterly separated from the five senses. Kamehi, kama in the plural is the five senses. Viviccha akusalehi damehi, separated from the unwholesome qualities. Akusala dhamma, akusala dhamma, akusala dhamma. That's the Abhidhamma chant. <laughs> I shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't bring that in here, but it kind of just, uh, that's exactly the same word, Akusla Dhamma. So these are the unwholesome qualities of mind, uh, yeah? And you leave those, they, those kind of disappear as you enter the first jhana state. Uh. So at this point, the mindfulness of breathing stops, yeah? Because when you come into the first jhana, there is no more, uh, you can't see the breath anymore, the breath is gone. Uh, you're still breathing, the body is still breathing, but you are not aware of it. Uh, it's outside of your ability to focus or to see anything here. Yeah. So um, this, this then is the contemplation of the mind. And again, you will see very interesting when you compare this uh, uh, to what you see in the Satipatthana Sutta, it is quite different. Uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta, they say that you contemplate mind with loba, or with raga, I think, with desire, contemplate uh, mind with dosa, with ill will, mind with moha, confusion, and mind without raga, without desire, without ill will, and without confusion. And then you have the, uh, the, the mind which is um, sankitta, which means contracted. That's like there's a bit of tiredness and lethargy there. And you have the mind which is vikitta, which means like, uh, it, vikitta means like distracted or going into many places at once. Yeah, distracted mind. And then you have the mind which is uh, mahagata. Mahagata means large, gone to greatness, mahagata. You have the anuttara mind, anuttara citta, which means unsurpassed. You have the um, vimutta citta. Yeah, you have so, and you have also the opposite. You have the, you have the uh, anuttara and the. Do we have the opposite? I think you have the opposite there as well. The uh, anuttara and the uttara. Now I'm getting a bit confused here. And vimutta and abhimutta, freed and not freed. Yeah. So you have like these, uh, all of these. Um, qualities of the mind that point towards samadhi. Mahagata, the large mind, is the, is the mind in samadhi. Anuttara is the unsurpassed mind, again, the mind in samadhi. Vimutta mind is the mind in samadhi. So these are all pointers towards samadhi experiences. And uh, so again, you see this kind of uh, duality there uh, in the Satipatthana Sutta, where on the one hand, you focus on the bad qualities of the mind, you have the desire, the greed, the uh, ill will, etc. On the other hand, you have all the wonderful qualities of the mind, the samadhi qualities. Uh, yeah? And so again, so you ask yourself, what happened to contemplating all of these bad qualities of the mind? Uh, well, you don't actually have to contemplate them. Uh, yeah? All you have to do is follow the process you find here in this sutta, and by abandoning these bad qualities, uh, you know them again through their absence. Uh, that is the kind of the point. Uh. And so you understand greed or desire by the absence of desire. Then it becomes very, very clear what it is. Uh. As long as desire is there, you can't fully understand it. Uh. You can't fully understand all the most refined uh, manifestations of greed. Uh. Why? Because you don't even know whether you've come to the end of greed yet. Uh. Only when you have gone beyond desire can you understand it. Uh. 
And so this is what this is about again. You don't have to contemplate all of these negative things. Anyway, we know what, you know what ill will is, that is the coarse manifestations. And uh, now you know fully what is going on. So this is a uh, contemplation of uh, dhammas. And um, this is uh, how it works uh, and how this uh, contemplation takes you all the way to the jhana stages. Uh, and uh, so that's, that's good. <laughs> So let's do some meditation together. Okay, here. Yeah. Everyone's ready. Yeah. Comments or questions or uh, uh, good afternoon, Anjan. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to ask, sometimes when I meditate and I sit still for a while, um, the thoughts will stop coming. Uh, the, the, the thoughts will stop. Uh -huh. So there is some, some quiet in, in my mind and, I, and I'm able to meditate and sit quietly. Okay. But sometimes I wonder, I don't feel at peace. I don't feel bliss. I don't feel happy. And sometimes I feel a bit confused, like there's nothing coming in. It feels, it, it, it seems all blank. Mm. And I don't know what to do. Like, and sometimes I question myself, am I doing it right? Because, you know, it says yeah. here, I breathe in stealing mental processes. I <laughs> breathe in gladdening the mind. And I was wondering when, when, when's that coming? Like, yeah. it, 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 it doesn't come. So I just feel like maybe I'm missing something. Yeah. Yeah, so it can, I mean, there's many reasons why that can happen. It, one of them is that the mind is a bit too, a uh, little bit dull, you know, a little bit dull, doesn't have that energy or whatever. Uh, and so that probably quite likely is one of the hindrances that is still there. Uh, and if the mind is dull, sometimes the mind doesn't even want to think. It's too kind of too lazy to think, so it doesn't think anything. And so it goes into this kind of dull, slightly lazy thing. And that's, it's okay. Yeah, you, at least you can relax a little bit and get a little bit of uh, peace in that sense. There's nothing really wrong with that. Uh, but what you really want to do is you want to, have the peace and the energy coming together. That's really ideally what you want. Uh, and this is where some, many of these contemplations that you do on the path become very useful because these contemplations, they brighten the mind uh, and they give the mind the chance to uh, experience some joy, like the contemplation of your conduct, the contemplation of generosity. We'll come to these things later on. Simple things like being with your Kaldenamittas together. All of these things can brighten the mind and give them that extra energy. Uh, uh, sometimes the case is that in daily life, the, the mind is just too tired to really be able to kind of, you know, bring up that energy, yeah, because you're doing so many things. Most people these days they are way too busy, and on top of being way too busy, they have mobile phones, which makes them even more busy. Yeah? And so the mobile phone kind of drains the last bit of energy you had. It kind of goes into the mobile phone. <laughs> it doesn't go into the meditation practice. And mobile phones are really, I think they are really, because, you know, it means you're always kind of, always doing something, always active, checking the latest update or whatever it is that, you know, people do on these things. So you, uh, so um, sometimes what you have to do is you have to kind of extract yourself a little bit from your ordinary life and go on a retreat for a while uh, and then see what happens. Uh, and then you get a chance to see whether maybe you are able to enjoy the uh, you know, get some joy and happiness. Uh, you just all you needed was just to get enough rest and enough sleep, and uh, let your mind be for a while, uh, allow it to uh, relax a little bit, and then actually the mind is able to. Uh, these things just come naturally as a consequence. Uh, there's a twofold thing. First of all, you need to make sure that the mind is properly rested, not too tired. Uh, and the second thing is that you need to use these kind of contemplations to bring up some joy in the mind. The two things kind of coming, uh, often coming together. Uh, so this is what I would uh, would recommend, uh, yeah. And so sometimes you just have to keep on going for a long time. Eventually, it kind of comes together. Uh, hi, Ajahn. Uh, I would like to understand more about uh, Nimita. Is it Nimita? Nimita. And I Nimita. think uh, somebody also said Kalapas. 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 <laughs> what is the difference? Yeah. What the difference is? The difference is that Kalapas is something you find in the 
sub-commentaries uh, of the, um, the Pali works. It's a kind of Abhidhamma terminology, which uh, is supposed to be that you're seeing material phenomena, you're seeing kind of atomic uh, material phenomena in the mind. This is kind of the idea of kalapas. Uh, I don't really know much about it, uh, but it's used in the, the, in the power meditation system. They talk about kalapas, for example. Uh, uh, but the, so the kalapas are not really found in the uh, in the suttas at all. Actually, it's a good question. I wonder where they where do they first occur the kalapas? Uh, I wonder. I'm not sure if it is in the suttas. The, I don't think it's. No, I know it's not in the suttas, but I wonder whether it's the commentaries or the sub commentaries. Uh, so let's have a quick look uh, where it might be. Uh. Ah, every, yeah, you can see everything I'm doing. That's kind of a, that's a bit concerning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I better not do any. I better do good things. So. Um, aha, ah, that's interesting. Itavuttaka Pali. Itavuttaka Kalapangva. I wonder what that means. Isn't it verse in the Itavuttaka? That's interesting. Kalapangva. Hmm. That's fascinating. I've never seen that before. Huh? Then you have it in the Jataka. So there's one, there seems to be one canonical reference to Kalapa in the Itivuttaka, which is kind of interesting. But uh, then you have the in the Jatakas and the Melinda Panya, you can see over here, the various versions of the various, I don't know if you can see it, but uh, uh, and then the rest here, Kalapas are found in the commentaries. Uh, the Attakat, you see here the Attakata, these are the commentaries over here, uh, one after the other, various kind of commentaries. Uh, more commentaries, well, so many commentaries. Uh, then you have the Tikas, the Tika here is the sub-commentaries, uh, so what you can see here is a kalapa is basically a term found in the commentaries uh, and in the sub-commentaries. Uh. So it is not something you find in the suttas. Uh. Whereas um, the idea of nimittas uh, is a sutta term, but it's not actually used in that way. Uh, that term is not used, nimittas is not used in the suttas, but the idea of nimittas is found in the suttas, uh, in the sense of lights and shapes that you see in meditation. Uh. Thank you, Ajahn. Yeah. Good afternoon, Ajahn. Uh, I try. I don't know whether I can phrase my question. Uh -huh. I find this sutta. I have read this sutta before, but this time I find that there's a pack full of information yeah. on the practice. Yeah. So. Uh, my question is, uh, does, does the, the order of like uh, Kayanu, Pasana, Vedana, Pasana, when we practice, does it goes in that order? Like Kayanu, Pasana, then Vedana, then Chitanu, Pasana. Is that the experience? Mm, yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. And another question is um, on the Vedana, Pasana, it says here you experience rupture and then bliss. And then mental processes. Is that bliss? Mental processes? Yeah, they are, they are the same thing in a sense. So the, the bliss is one kind of mental process. And uh, yeah. So does, does it go in that order or that when we were practicing, sometimes rupture will come up and sometimes bliss will come up and then sometimes stealing of the mind yeah. comes up. Is that, that how it goes? It goes roughly in that order because rapture is um, the way it is defined in the sutta as a bliss is a more refined kind of happiness. Uh, and so the course of happiness comes first and more refined things come afterwards. Uh, yeah, It kind of follows the natural kind of, the mind has a natural kind of way of developing the more coarse things and the more refined things. It's just like peace. You don't go from no peace to absolute peace. You go via all the various levels of peace. There's a gradual movement. Uh, and the same thing will happen is there's a gradual change in the mind towards more refined kinds of happiness. Uh, and so rapture, piti comes first, and then sukha comes later on. Uh, and then comes the calming down of the chitta sankhara, the, uh, the, the mental processes. Uh. Thank you, Bajan. Yeah. So does that mean that uh, if, let's say, um, I'm experiencing a rapture, does that experience come like a momentary or it's kind of like? It can come momentary. The momentary can be kind of come like, like blips, like yeah. flashes of rapture. Yeah, suddenly you feel like a flash or something yeah. and it's a rapture. Yes. Uh, but it can also be like a continuous experience, a continuous movement. Uh, it can also be more, it doesn't have to be 
very moving, it can also be more stale. It comes all kind of all kind of times. Uh, but uh, the, the first one, which is more like um, flash, is is, is um, kind of rudimentary form, and then you want to kind of make it more stable over time. Uh, yeah. So to make it more stable, it means that we will yeah. we will. It says here they practice like this. Our breathe out experiences yeah. rupture. So does that mean that we will stay with the breathing in and out while the experiencing is happening? Yeah, yeah. So the breath is always like the anchor for oh. the meditation, and so you stay with the breath, and then as the as you stay with the breath, and there is this development happening in the mind. Yeah, I mean you also experience the rapture as well because you can't avoid it. Noticing it, yeah, <laughs> so you will certainly be with it, but the breath is yes. like the anchor which makes sure that you don't lose your way, so to speak, in the meditation. You have something to hold on to. Huh? One last question, I don't sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay. Um, when you mentioned experiencing the mind, yeah. it's when there's uh, the five sense, mm -hmm. is experiencing the no five sense, therefore yeah. we can experience the mind. Yeah. So just now Ajahn mentioned... Uh, it's kind of like crystal light and uh, brightness. Mm. So that is the uh, experiencing the mind. Yeah, it's like a, it's a, it has it usually has a shape. It has a form like a disc, and it also has a brightness. So. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you, Ajay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. Good afternoon, Ajahn Pramali. Good afternoon. Yeah. Uh, I would like to ask is like uh, just now Jan Pramali said the stability of the mind got stages like so I want I was wondering if like um, is it Nimita also got the stages like maybe you see the light and you are joyful and you are bliss but you still can hear then it means that it's not Nimita or it's the very I mean low 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 yeah no, it, low experiencing yeah. of that joyness is not that uh, is it is it got level? May I know that? It, there, there is different levels, yeah, because the nimitta can be very quite weak, and then it can be medium, and it can be very powerful. Uh, it's like this, you know, the sun can be very strong. Maybe the sun behind the cloud is a bit weak, and then the sun is really powerful when it comes out in the sky. Or it can be like the moon, which is more weak. So it comes in all kind of degrees, uh, and uh, the um, your ability to feel the, or be aware of the senses will depend on the power of the nimitta. So the senses will, all, will actually be there in the background all the way till you enter jhana. Yeah? So as long as the nimitta is there, the senses will also be there to some extent. Yeah? There will be some availability. For example, if there's a loud sound, you will hear it, even if the mind is very much uh, you know, enjoying the nimitta stage, or you will still hear it. So the senses are still available to you, uh, but they will tend to fade. So when I say that you move away from the five senses, it's not complete moving away. Uh, that is uh, uh, mostly moving away uh, at that point. Uh, Thank yeah. you, Ajahn. Yeah. But may I ask, like, if sometimes, may, like, maybe you got that experience, yeah. and then you will have the desire, like, one, that joyfulness, and whenever you sit down, yeah. you will got the expectation, but yeah. you won't reach that anymore, then yeah. how to overcome that when you, <laughs> you love and enjoy yeah. meditation, yeah. but you won't, always got the joyfulness, yeah. but then you seems like attached and you get disappointed and you always say, why I cannot experience like the last experience or, or so on like that. So how to overcome that? May I know? Thank you. Okay. So the, so the, the, the way, the number of ways, number of things you can do. And one thing is just gradually getting used to it. Yeah. And gradually get used to the idea and you start to understand that actually you know, the way to be peaceful and the way to be happy is just to be with it and go with it and go with the flow and not really. So you understand through experience that it works that way. Uh, the other thing is that to remember that meditation is always about looking to the causes and conditions that give rise to the experience. Uh, and the causes and conditions are to stay peacefully with the object and allow things to be, to be the passenger on the train. Uh, but to have expectations is the opposite of being the passenger. Uh, the expectations is to expect the driver to take you in a certain direction. Uh, but if you are on a train, can you? Does it make sense to expect the driver to take you? Doesn't make any sense, right? The driver is going to wear, go where he wants. It doesn't matter. And if you go up to the driver and tell him what to do, he probably gets really upset with you. Yeah, that's the end of that meditation. <laughs> so just remember, causes and conditions are what you should focus on. What are the things that lead to this result? Uh, this is the third way of thinking about this is to think that. Uh, 
uh, the experiences are not always the same. They're often a bit different. Uh, they vary a bit. They come in a large number of varieties and degrees and all these kind of things. Uh, and so you don't really know what you can expect. Uh, and so when you expect things, uh, you're probably expecting the wrong thing anyway, uh, because you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. And uh, so, the so expectation is actually a kind of delusion because actually you'll probably experience something slightly different this time. So open up your mind instead uh, to new experiences, to new possibilities. Uh, be like uh, curious, what might happen this time? Maybe something else will happen. Uh, yeah. And that is kind of the idea of the Zen mind, beginner's mind, uh, where you never, this is a book that was written back in the 1970s. Uh, I think it was the only book Ajahn Brahm read on Buddhism when he was in the, in the early days in Thailand. It was kind of the, the one, but it has a nice title, Zen mind, beginner's mind. You always have the beginner's mind. Uh, you're curious. Uh, what's going to happen now? I don't know. Uh, the problem is that you have been corrupted by your experience, so you can't really, you can't let go properly. Yeah, like Corrupted is too, wrong a, is a, too strong a word. Uh, but that experience makes it very hard to have the beginner's mind again. Uh, so remind yourself, I don't know what's going to happen this time. Uh, wow, how interesting. Uh, and so then you allow new things to occur instead. Uh, no expectations. Uh. So Ajahn, the giving up of the five senses, uh... <clears throat> is it similar to the process of dying where the five senses are kind of fading off and that's why you see people say I'm seeing a light when you know about to die or something yeah like that. yeah yeah possibly and sometimes yeah I, I don't know if it always is the same but possibly it's similar kind of thing yeah yeah there's a lot of similarities between dying and meditation anyway because both are processes of letting go yeah so uh, uh, by meditating, you learn to die. By dying, you learn to meditate. So that's why they are so close to each other. Yeah? And so that's a very, it's a very useful thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and you, uh, so sometimes, <laughs> no, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully nobody gets concerned, afraid of uh, meditation if it is like dying. <laughs> it has a lot of sim a lot of similarities uh, to each other, and that's why they kind of work together very well, and why the contemplation of death is useful, uh, and why meditation is good for uh, dying eventually. Uh. Mm. Better to die in meditation. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the best one. Yeah. 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 Mm. Mm. Really? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Many years ago. All right. Sounds like a nice thing to nice place to die. So that's good. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Sorry, Venerable, to be bombarding you with questions, but I really have some doubts very quickly. Yeah. Uh, since Nimitta um, is obviously beyond sight because we're moving beyond the five senses, is you're actually perceiving it through your mind or it's yeah. the sign of mind. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's beyond senses, but you can still kind of uh, have uh, kind of subtle. Um, sensation of those five senses they're still in the background yeah so when you start seeing the meta there are two options which are there because initially if the nimitta is dull so one can still uh, feel the breath faintly mm. so one would be to keep on with the breath till the nimitta becomes uh, stronger the other option would be uh, i'm asking you the other option is uh, do you keep on looking at the center of the nimitta and keep on focusing on the center and the joy till it gets stronger or go back to the breath so that is first question. Hmm. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So it, it depends. It's kind of hard to be absolutely sure. But if you find that the nimitta kind of fades away, if you try to look, kind of observe it, then it's better to go back to breath to strengthen the, uh, the samadhi before you move on to the uh, nimitta. But if you find that when you move on to the nimitta, it sustains itself and it gets brighter, then you can go to the nimitta. So you have to experiment a bit and see what works for you now. So it's yeah. mostly, they say, always in the center of Nimitta, right? You should not yeah. re really be. Yeah. yeah. And Nimitta, sorry. Uh, please, yeah. And Nimitta, uh, like classically, obviously, you see a disc of light or something, but I've seen people like uh, sometimes see skull or jaw or things like that. Yeah. So it, it, it can be uh, multiple as well. It has to always be one single thing and could be anything which is bright and has a shape. Yeah, it probably, it probably can. I, it depends. I mean, the thing is that uh, the mind is very creative. And then so it depends on uh, sometimes these nimittas can be a creation of the mind, like you make a size. Sometimes it can be very complicated things that you see. Uh, and it's not really a proper samadhi nimitta at that stage. Uh, 
usually the more simple it is, the more proper it is as a Samadhi Nimitta. So sometimes what happens if you kind of see a skull in your mind, then well, if you keep on watching that skull, eventually it will also turn into a proper Samadhi Nimitta further down the track. Yeah? So this could be just a preliminary image in your mind uh, yeah, that you have, first of all. Uh, the simpler it is, the more powerful it is. Uh, a skull is still quite complex. Right. So, uh, so most of the time, Samadhi Nimitta would be something like round or square or whatever, some simple shape. It yeah. should be bright and with with, yeah. with, a, okay, with an outline. Yeah. Um, the uh, other thing was, um, suppose um, somebody who enters the jhanas for the first time and they do so um, not under supervision. Um, so is it kind of, could it be, obviously it can be scary, but... Uh, what should person do once person sees a bright light and you're experiencing it without any you know guidance at that time yeah. um and then uh how to come out of jhanas and whether you should always um enter into jhanas although it's not within your hands of course when you're doing a retreat uh, with monks or like how to kind of be yeah. uh, conscious about entering and coming out of the jhanas Okay, I, basically I, what you do is you just stay with that nimitta and you uh, just allow things to happen. Yeah, that's kind of the, that's the ideal. Uh, and so you, uh, you, know, you have to lean on all your the things that you have taught about dhanas uh, you know, being safe places to go and just kind of allow the process to happen. Uh, you have to kind of trust the process in, in many ways. Uh, and whether there are someone else around or not doesn't really help very much because at this point you can't really ask anyone at this point what to do, yeah? So you, uh, I mean, there isn't much danger because you are, the mind is so blissed and so happy. So even if you get a bit of fear at that particular point, uh, um, the worst that can happen is that you lose your samadhi, you lose your ability to con continue with the nimitta. So, wow. so, but, you know, one of the things, the nice uh, um, pieces of advice that you find in the suttas is the idea of staying with things for a while before you move on to the next stage. Uh, there's a famous symbol of the mountain cow, the mountain cow that moves from one pasture to another one. And if she moves too quickly from one pasture to the next one, she will kind of lose her footing. She hasn't really established herself properly in the previous pasture. And the same thing with, with the samadhi, you kind of you learn stage by stage and you find yourself solidly happy where you are before you move on there. So, okay, so you come to the nimitta stage and you stay there. You learn how to deal with that. You feel secure with it. You get access to it whenever you want. Maybe not whenever you want, but you quite regularly. And then when you feel secure there, then okay, you, maybe you allow the mind to move forward yeah, and to the next one. So there's a bit, a bit of self-contradiction in what I'm saying. On the one hand, I said that let the mind develop, but uh, it, it is possible to also hold the mind back from going further for a while. Yeah? You can do that quite easily. Uh, and then other times you just allow the mind to move on. Uh, so make sure that you have a firm footing uh, before you move on to the next one. Uh, and then at least you won't lose the place you were before by going too fast. And then you automatically come out of jhanas or do you have to do something to come out of it? it automatically it just happens. Uh, yeah. So you just, you just have to wait. Yeah. And the last question, yeah. Jan, is <laughs> um, uh, what is the relationship between stream entry and jhanas? So yeah. since my understanding is since you are a stream enter, you're already on the path. So you have access to jhanas in the sense you are, that's the part of the path. Yeah. Uh, but is... Um, uh, it, it, anybody who enters jhanas, therefore, is a stream enter, no. which I kind of, because there are very few stream enters in the world, I would have thought so. Yeah, yeah, no, no, the, the stream enter is beyond jhana. Stream enter is more profound because remember the whole point here is that you're giving things up, yeah? And if, to enter a jhana, you have to give up a large number of things. You have to give up the five senses, the body. There's only a tiny bit of reality left, which is the bliss and happiness you have in the first jhana. But that too has to be given up to, enter, to become a stream enter. A stream enter is a full insight uh, into the impermanence of all the five khandhas. Uh, so everything is kind of given up. Uh, so the natural process is jhana, then stream entry, uh, because it is a, one is a more full and complete insight into the nature of reality here. Uh. Once you enter the fourth jhana, once you enter the fourth jhana, yeah. um, then it's then you are a stream enter, isn't it? Then the, the fourth jhana, I think that you will probably become a stream enter somewhere on the path between the first jhana and the fourth jhana. Yes, very likely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajahn, for yep. predicting. Okay. <laughs>